of the 20th century, accelerator-based high-energy physics was the paradigmatic kind of physics. And we got ever bigger accelerators built. Synchrotron radiation was just a waste product that just happened to be created whenever you accelerated electrons. And access to those synchrotron radiation beams was granted more or less grudgingly by the high energy physicists to other less fundamental physicists like solid state physicists or even molecular biologists. That has changed quite a bit in the last few decades. It's becoming more and more common to build large accelerators, large particle accelerators, not to study the particles by smashing them into one another, but to use these electromagnetic uh, radiation that was originally considered a waste for other purposes like material sciences or biology. Robert Feidenhansel is the chairman and uh, managing, uh, managing director of the European Excel in Hamburg, which operators, operates one of the most advanced of these new kind of accelerators. And he wants to tell us about the new paradigm in science that these devices enable. Have much fun with Robert Feidenhansel. Thank you very much, and thank you for the introduction. I hope that the uh, that the technical difficulties are over now. Uh, so we'll see. So uh, I will tell about X-ray free X-ray lasers. I call my talk a new paradigm in science. I hope that the uh, uh, translator can uh, can follow because I'm a fast uh, speaker. So on this uh, first slide, you see the opening of the free electron laser with the uh, green laser from the Earth Philharmonie. You see the free electron laser in the middle, and you see the uh, directors of European x uh, to the right. Uh, uh, you see me with the, that's the uh, guy with the gray hair in the back. Um, so I'll give you a personal view on where we are with all this here. So European x it's a European, it's a European facility. You see the shareholder countries, it's X-rays. Um, we want to see atoms and molecules, so you need X-rays for the short wavelengths. We use uh, free electrons and we have a laser. And I think it's uh, quite uh, quite timely to give the talk now because it's actually nearly uh, 125 years ago we had the uh, first uh, the anniversary for the first X-ray image, which was taken on the 22nd of December 1895. So uh, this is uh, what I'm going to tell about. What is what are free electron lasers? What is European x -ray? What's your organization? What's the layout? How do we actually do science? And then at the very, very end, tell a little bit about why it's important to do this kind of science. So my, uh, my background here, I have nearly 40 years of experience in X-ray science. I'm uh, coming from Denmark. I'm actually sitting now in Roskilde in Denmark right now. Been, I'm a professor at the Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen. I've been in Hamburg uh, since 2017. And as you see from, uh, I don't know how many physicists are among you, then uh, the physicists probably know uh, PhD comics. And this is uh, Professor Smith. And I'm, uh, you see, I'm nearly looking the same and uh, as Professor Smith, I've not done experiments or data analysis for the year, so I'm just the managing director. So uh, <clears throat> as you heard in the introduction, X-rays uh, for science is today generated by synchrotron radiation facilities and uh, lately also by X-ray free insulators. So you see this plot here, which shows the quality factor or the power of X-rays called average brilliance as a function of years. And you see from about 1960, the quality of uh, um, X-rays has uh, increased dramatically. So this increase here, which is uh, basically a, a logarithmic uh, growth here, it uh, grows faster than Moore's law. And all of you know Moore's law, and this year it even grows, uh, grows faster, which gives us problems because our uh, data generation is basically proportional with the with the brilliance. So we produce data faster than the increase in Moore's law. And I have been uh, in the field since uh, 1981, where I was a student, a summer student at DC in Hamburg. And I can tell you it has been a fantastic experience 
following this increase of uh, more than 10 orders of magnitude uh, during your, your, your career. So uh, <clears throat> what are X-ray free ultra lasers? So X-ray free ultra lasers, as you heard in the introduction, uh, this is the accelerator. It's, the, uh, it's based on accelerators. So you have an accelerator of, of electrons, which uh, on the left you have the uh, a, um, uh, electron emitter where you emit electrons uh, by the laser. You have a LINAC to accelerate the uh, the electrons. You have a bunch compressor to make them very short. You have an electron bunch, which is very short. You have another LINAC. You put electrons through an undulator where the electrons uh, do a, a, a sinusoidal path where they produce X-rays, and then you throw away the electrons in an electron beam dump. And you need to have X-rays uh, for the kind of science we want to do because we want to see atom cell molecules and X-rays are very in energetic um, uh, light particles, photons, and therefore you need a long and, and big accelerator. So the undulators that produce light uh, looking like, uh, like this here, these are magnetic devices where the electrons go when you uh, go through the uh, the undulator, they take a sinusoidal path. We have about uh, three of the we have three of these undulators, and each of them is about 150 meters long. So uh, so this uh, it's a huge uh, piece of infrastructure with very very many single magnets. So the whole trick about uh, lasers is that you need coherent light. You need to have the the, uh, the particles that em emit light to be organized in a certain array. On the left, you see a non-coherent bunch, which are electrons normally uh, generating light in a synchrotron. We want to uh, align them to have a coherent bunch, so they all send out light <coughs> that is uh, uh, being amplified coherently. And the way you do that is uh, you do it by lacing in one pass. So we use a principle called self-amplified spontaneous emission, which was introduced by Evgeny Saldin uh, on the left. You see him on the, on the left where he received a, uh, a prize. He um, <clears throat> invented this idea in Novosibirsk in the uh, uh, late uh, 70s in the last century. And uh, the principle was then <clears throat> uh, further developed. The idea is that you have an, uh, uh, the long undulator. You see here the undulator with the uh, green and yellow, the uh, green and, uh, and red uh, magnets. The electrons go through the, uh, through the, uh, the, the undulator. The electrons follow the yellow path. They wiggle up and down. They emit light. Every time they accelerate, they emit light. The lights get stronger and stronger. They interact with the electron beam and then aligns up the electron. So you see that in the lower charge here, the electron cloud coming in is homogeneous. Then it goes along the undulator where it starts to get sliced up into, into certain slices. And at the very end, you have a micro bunched uh, electron cloud where all the electrons emit light to hear me and you get a extremely powerful uh, X-ray beam coming out, and then you throw away the electrons. So you only use the electrons once. So here's the, uh, here's the European X-Fell in a nutshell at, uh, in Hamburg. At Schienefeld, you see the uh, Daisy Barnfeld campus, where we uh, start, and then in Schienefeld, just across the, uh, the border to Schleswig-Holstein, you then see the, the European X-Fell. So the electron injector starts here in, in Barnfeld, where the electrons are injected uh, <coughs> into the uh, accelerator. It's a superconducting uh, accelerator, so the accelerator is, uh, is uh, cooled uh, cool, uh, cool down to 2 Kelvin, in, um, and that uh, has special uh, properties, uh, which I'll come back to. Here you see the, uh, a small movie. I hope you can see the movie. Can anybody tell me whether your movie can be seen? No. Okay. I hope you can yes, see. It's okay. Yeah. You, you see the movie. Okay, good. So you see the electrons are being accelerated through the uh, two Kelvin cold uh, Niobium um, uh, cavities. Uh, then we have uh, the undulator systems uh, where here in Ostover Born. Um, and then we have the experimental uh, stations out here for research. And you see here, uh, again, this is the undulator system I showed you before. The electrons are passing through the undulator, and then you can 
can follow them. Uh, this is the undulate, and soon you see the uh, the electrons are going there. You can see due to the magnetic structure, they wiggle far from back, far from back, and you see the uh, <coughs> the electron, uh, the light is uh, being emitted that you see as a uh, the the white cloud, and then at the end they then uh, send out a big a big burst of photons. And here is the experimental station, the experimental hall where we uh, do experiments. So you have uh, three undulators. We call them uh, SARS-1, SARS-2, and SARS-3. And then we have six experimental stations where we use this very powerful X-ray beam coming out to do experiments. Uh, you see here the, uh, the two beam dumps where we throw away the electrons called XXDU1 and XXDU2. That's the, uh, the beam dumps. And then we have the six experiments where we do uh, different kind of, uh, of of experiments. I'll I'll come back to that. Here's a uh, typical uh, um, instrument station. The X-rays are coming from the right, going towards the left. Uh, you uh, at the first you see some uh, some various uh, optics where you can manipulate the X-ray beam. You can you can uh, focus it. You can uh, measure how intense it is. Then in the middle with this blue bar. You have an experiment where the X-rays are scattered off a, a sample. Then you have a, a, a detector, and I'll come back to the, the detector here. This is this uh, big piece with the yellow uh, front, and then you have a uh, monitoring system at the very end. So this is a, uh, a, a, a typical person will be as, uh, as, as big of, uh, as this detector. This robot arm is actually to... Uh, um, manipulate another another detector. The sample is sitting just in front of the of the robot arm. And here is the uh, the uh, the detectors. I'll come back to the detectors later on. They produce a tremendous amount of uh, data, which we then need to to analyze. This is a a large pixel detector, a uh, one million um, pixels in in kind. It's uh, delivered by uh, from the uh, by by the UK. And here is uh, the uh, people we have all this for. This is a user community. So we are a user facility where people can book in and do an experiment uh, they, uh, by a proposal. A typical group here, you see six, seven, uh, eight uh, different groups. They come in, do an experiment uh, for about uh, five days or 60 hours, uh, five times uh, Type, uh, 12 hours, you either measure during the night or during, during, during the day. And in the end, we hope that we can do 200 of these user experiments per year. So a user group is uh, uh, basically 10 to, uh, to 100 people consisting of different uh, university or different uh, institutes that come and, and do the experiment together with us. So here's a little bit about the uh, facts of the European Expo. As I said, it's a user facility, so the science we do is determined by our, our users. We have 12 member countries. Germany pays a little bit more than half, 58%. Russia, which is a little bit unusual, pays 27%. So a big, uh, about a quarter, and all the other countries, the remaining 10 countries, contribute between 1% and 3% of the construction and operation cost. Daisy runs the accelerator for us. We are about 500 people on the Schienefeld side for the, doing the experiments and uh, the maintenance and administration, etc. And uh, Daisy has about 250 people running the accelerators. It costed about 1.5 billion euros uh, to build it in 2018 prices, and the running cost is about 135 million a year. And you see our end goal will be to do about 200 user experiments per year. We are not there yet, but uh, we've only been op operating for about three years. So where are we in the, uh, in, in the world? We are not the only one who have a, a heart uh, X-ray uh, free electron laser. The first one was in Stanford at LCLS. In 2009, they opened. Then the Japanese came two years after in 2011. Then the Swiss in 2016, and the Koreans also in 2016. And the number you should take note of here is how many X-ray pulses 
per second will come. The X-ray facility is a pulse source, so you get a number of pulses per second, and these facilities here deliver between 60 and 120 pulses per second. Here, European x well is uh, very particular because we have the superconducting accelerator where we have a megahertz sponge structure, so we have a burst mode where we have 10 burst of very strong X-rays coming per second. And in these bursts, we have up to 2,700 X-ray pulses. So in total, we can deliver 27,000 X-ray pulses per, per second, but they come in this burst mode where every, every uh, um, tenth of a second, we have a new burst of X-rays coming in. Um, and that makes us the most uh, powerful uh, X-ray source in the um, in the world. So um, we want to measure atomic motion. We want to see how atoms and molecules are moving. We want to measure on very short time scale. But what is the time scale of the atoms? Now, for humans, you would say the time scale, our time scale is, uh, is actually uh, uh, milliseconds uh, because that's sort of the, the time scale we move on. If you drive a car and the, uh, the car in front of you stops, you need to react within milliseconds. Now, the interesting time scale, uh, uh, while the interesting time scale for humans is milliseconds, it's femtoseconds for atoms. And you can see that be, by the speed of sound in a material, it's uh, 3,000 meters per second. The distance between atoms is three angstroms. Then we can, uh, can uh, say that sort of the interesting time scale is about 100 femtoseconds. So that is the time scale you want to, to do experiments if you want to see atoms move, as you see in this uh, uh, acoustic vibration you, you see up there. So that's interesting time scale. And that is exactly the time scale of uh, the pulses coming out of our free electron lasers. If you look at the uh, synchrotron radiation light on the left, which is a picture facility at, uh, at DAISY, there you get about 10 to the 9 photons, X, uh, light particles per pulse, and the pulse length is about 100 picoseconds, which is much longer than, than 100 uh, femposeconds. So the cell will give you 10 to the 13 photons uh, in about uh, 2 to 100 femposeconds. So we have a, an enormous amount of, of photons on a very short time scale. And that's the difference between X-ray lasers and synchrotron lasers. So we measure time, we measure the dynamics on a very short time scale. This also makes that we have an extremely and exceptionally strong X-ray beam. You, normally you would say you can uh, uh, stop X-rays by, for instance, lead that uh, can, uh, can, can shield the, uh, the X-ray beam so it's, it's not harmful. But with a, this X-ray beam we have, which is a very strong laser beam, it can be focused to a few microns. If you do that, then you can drill a hole through a piece of steel in less than half a minute. You can see here a piece of steel on the left. It's five centimeters thick. And, then, and uh, you can see the, the entrance hole uh, to the lower right and the exit hole to the to the upper right. And within half a minute, the X-ray beam has basically drilled a hole uh, through this uh, this piece of steel because it's so in intense and uh, it comes with a sh such a short pulse that it creates a plasma and the uh, material evaporates. So if you focus the beam, nothing can actually stop it. <clears throat> and therefore, we have to have very special safety requirements um, around our our experiments. Now this here, I don't know whether it actually works. This could show you the extra beam where we have a tube on the uh, on the on the right, um, and now I let it run, and then I just hope you can see it, and then uh, you would see in a few uh, seconds the extra beam come. So this is the extra beam that goes into air, ionizes the air, and it basically drills hole in the air. Uh, it, it, the penetration here is much longer than you would uh, have anticipated, and the noise which you might hear is the is the 10 hertz noise. So every uh, time you see a burst coming in, it ionizes the air and shows this uh, this uh, this kind of light here. I hope you saw it. Did you see it? Can somebody tell me where you actually saw this uh, small movie? Yes, there was some movement. The bad okay, part no, 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 a bit in the into the audio, but okay. Okay, good, good. Okay. 
So, how do we then do the experiments? Now I told you about the, uh, the whole setup. Now I go a little bit back and look, say, how did I do experiments when I was young, or how did you do data collection the traditional way? So I took here the example of the double helix. On the left, you have Rosalind Franklin, who was the, the woman who actually took the first the, uh, diffraction data of DNA, which you see in the, um, in the middle there, diffraction data. You saw a sample, which was a, a kind of a, of a few crystals. And from such diffraction data, you could actually solve, solve the structure. And you see the uh, double helix structure here with James Watson and Francis Crick to the right. By the way, our guest house at the Schoenefer campus, you have uh, Rosen and Frankman on the, uh, on, on the front of the, of the building. But basically in those days, you had one crystal, you took one diffraction data, and you took one crystal off. So uh, this is uh, how I looked in, in the uh, 80s, early, early 90s. When we did the experiments at Daisy, we had one sample which we spent we prepared that for weeks and prepared and shine and so in this case it was a precious gold sample. Then we started this only sample for one or two weeks and then we went home with a small data set afterwards. This is not how we do the experiments today. We do it in a ragged, radically different manner. Now, but how do we do experiments? Because I told you this exceptionally strong beam that um, would drill holes in a piece of steel. So how can you study anything with such a, um, a, a, a powerful beam because it will get destroyed? And yes, the, uh, the samples are destroyed. And this was uh, shown here in about 20 years ago in the, one of the first studies. Can you at all study samples with such a strong beam? And here is a sample of a protein, the exploding protein, where the, uh, you need to beat the radiation damage because I showed you that the sample will evaporate. So can you take data from the sample before it evaporates? And here you see a protein you put into a beam, and then you see after uh, it, the beam hits it at zero, time it equals to zero, then you see how the sample looks at two femtoseconds, five femtoseconds, 10 femtoseconds, 20 femtoseconds, and it shows you have to be extremely fast to actually do the experiment to after see uh, reconstruct how the sample actually looks. But you need a very short pulse in order to do that. And that's exactly what we have, a pulse which is a few tens of uh, femtoseconds long, so you can actually take the picture of the sample. So the first experiment here was done um, also at DAISY, where they uh, used a, a, a smaller uh, X-ray facility than the one we have, where you took a, um, a had a piece of silicon where you had an engraved two men and a son. Um, you uh, can see a scanning electron microscopy picture of it here. Then you put it into this, took the sample, put it into the beam, recorded the diffraction image, and you see that uh, over here on the upper left. And from that diffraction image, you can actually reconstruct how the sample looked and that you see on the uh, to the to the right where you see the reconstruction of the of the two men and the sun now if you take a second um, uh, shot on this sample then you see the uh, scattering image on the lower left where there's actually nothing because the sample has completely evaporated so it shows the first beam is so powerful that it destroys you sample, but you can actually collect data fast enough that you can re reconstruct the sample and calculate how it actually looked. So this was an extremely important proof of principle that you are able to take your uh, scattering data so fast that you can actually see how the sample looked. So the uh, way the experiments are done today is done in a completely different manner. So here's a sketch where you have this uh, kind of yellow uh, um, uh, thing coming in. And these are the X-ray pulses, which are, are, are coming in this uh, burst mode with 10 of these X-ray pulses per second. Then you have a jet of sample, which is shown in green. These are small crystals of uh, some kind of protein you want to, to study. And then you, uh, you uh, look at the diffraction image to the upper right. And then you just shoot. Instead of only one sample, you have millions of samples and millions of scattering images 
You don't know how the atoms are looking, how they organized, but that you can sort of afterwards if you have a sufficient amount of data. So here's uh, what you call in the serial femtosecond crystallography. It's the same experiment. You have a lot of different uh, scattering images here. You have the samples coming in through this uh, jet GDVN, that the jet coming in. You can see if it works. I don't know how the movie works. You can see it, a real jet on the lower right. On my screen, it's a movie where you can uh, see a jet coming in from the right. When the X-ray beam hits the jet, it evaporates, and therefore you see it's got it gets uh, sistered up. And from these millions of uh, scattering images, you can then calculate a structure of uh, this uh, protein they wanted to study here on the right, where you see the uh, different uh, uh, atoms and uh, and molecules. But you need to collect a lot of data. So here's uh, one example of uh, science that has uh, been done where they did a proof of principle. Instead of looking at proteins, they looked at uh, millions of gold uh, nanocrystals. You can see them on the upper right. You then spray them very fast uh, into the X-ray beam. And then you collect just everything you can. In this case, it's 10 million diffraction images uh, were collected, and then you sort out the data afterwards and see what samples, uh, how did your samples actually look. And then you uh, can classify in this case that you had four different kinds of samples that you can do afterwards. You don't need to do that in forehand. You just take all the samples you have, throw them into the beam, and then via the software afterwards, you, you can then calculate what kind of structures they actually are. And that is what I mean, that it's a, it's a completely different way of doing science. And instead of one sample, you have millions of samples. And then you look afterwards, what kind of samples did you actually have? And it doesn't need to be homogeneous. Here's a, maybe a little bit uh, clumsy overhead formation of water bubbles and experiments that were done uh, a, about a year ago um, at the European x where they looked at water bubbles, creation of water bubbles. How is a water bubble actually formed in the, in the very first uh, uh, nanoseconds or femtoseconds after it's created. And, uh, and they had a, a laser to create water bubbles. They looked at it with x-rays, and then they just look at millions of water bubbles and then see by looking at the images of the water bubble how they, uh, are, are, uh, how they actually grow how fast they do, what's the density, and they can see that the water bubble is completely empty in the uh, in the middle, and just at the rim of the water bubble, the density of water is 40 to 50 percent higher than normal water. And then you can study the statistics by looking at these millions of uh, water bubbles. Another type of experiments we are doing is uh, is uh, we're looking at uh, uh, fundamental interaction and time scales. Something which is uh, also important for you is a magnetism where you store data. You need to, uh, uh, to understand how is the interaction between electrons, the, uh, the, uh, the, spins, the, uh, the spins of the electrons and the, and the lattice, and to see how, how is this interaction in order to design new magnetic devices that can um, switch much faster than the, than the ones we have today. So magnetism is actually one of the, uh, uh, one of the, uh, the, uh, the key areas that we are, are, are looking into. And here we had an experiment uh, by um, where we looked at magnetic modulators by a, a group from ITMO in St. Petersburg, where you can see the the uh, um, magnetic structure is uh, changing as a function of time on the picosect timescale. So um, I gave you some uh, some uh, some examples of what we're doing. Uh, the uh, sort of what we really want to do is uh, to look at the molecular movies uh, where we. For instance, trigger a process in a in a, in, in a protein and a photoactive protein. You see that on the uh, on the right, where you have a protein, it's uh, excited by an optical an orange optical laser. Then you have a blue X-ray protein coming in. You scatter off, and from that you can then uh, calculate the uh, the structure of the um, of the protein. On the left, you see the way we're doing experiments where we 
put in the uh, um, many, many proteins into the beam, measure a certain time delay, calculate the structure. And if you then measure uh, several time delays, so you see what happens after 10 femtoseconds, 20 femtoseconds, 100 femtoseconds after you uh, hit the uh, protein by the optical laser, you can then put together a number of still pictures and make molecular movies. And that is what we really want to do at the, our facility. And the first of this uh, kind of studies were, were done here. Uh, this is a, a, a paper from, oh, I think it was this year by, um, by Marius uh, Smith from Arizona, where they looked at the, at the, uh, a, uh, the photoactive yellow protein, where you can see from the left, it's a uh, three picoseconds, 10 picoseconds, so 30, uh, 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 80 and 100 picoseconds after you have excited this protein with a um, a, uh, a laser, a laser, a normal optical laser pulse, and that's important to understand how photosynthesis actually works in uh, in uh, in nature in these in these kind of uh, of proteins. So that will be one of the main focus areas for our facility. So here you can see the data that has been taken at the OP next one. Good. So now I told you a little bit about the uh, the science we uh, we are doing. I hope you got a a glimpse of the variety from nanoscience to magnetism to biocrystallography, and we do many other things. But maybe I'll uh, also show a little bit about the complexity of experiments we are actually doing uh, with a special focus on on the data. So here you uh, you have all the different or part of the different things that you need to have control of. You have the accelerator, which actually works exceptionally well. We have X-ray optics to focus exit beam. We have we need to measure photon diagnostics to see where is the beam, how intense is it. We need optical lasers to excite the samples, as I just showed you. We need a sample delivery, these, uh, uh, this jet of sample that is coming in with a, with a, with a very high speed. And that's also a lot of technology. And then we need our detectors where we measure the uh, scattered photons. And then we need to uh, analyze the immense amount of data we actually take. Um, and uh, we have a, a data department which uh, is in charge of detectors, the electronics, the controls, the data management, and the data analysis. Um, and we are about uh, typically about 100 staff uh, working on on this at UP Next firm. So here is the uh, <coughs> just repeat. Uh, here is the way the experiment is done. You have the high rep rate of X-ray bursts uh, coming into the uh, uh, hitting the uh, the sample jet. You have the uh, the uh, detectors uh, where collect all the data, and uh, we collect uh, three three thousand. 520 frames per second in this in this detector here. So here's the adaptive gain detector. It can switch the gain. It's a detector which has about a million calibration parameters. So uh, it's a it's a very complicated beast. Here's the pulse structure, and uh, we have these uh, pulses coming in in this burst mode. And within the burst, you don't have time to read off the the detector. So you need to store this detector can store 352 frames on the detector. And then between the bursts, where you nearly have a tenth of a second, then you can read out all this data and uh, store them away. So here's the uh, piece of uh, this uh, uh, Egypt detector. Here's the second one coming. So it's uh, it's uh, really, a, uh, this is the first experiment uh, uh, done with this uh, detector. You see, we're very pleased. And uh, it produces a lot of data. Now, now I go a little bit back and look here. When I started data analysis in real time, so we lead it. In, when I started here, you see on this uh, plot on the left, the data came out on a, a piece of paper. You know this Taylor type. You see the guy on the uh, on the on the right, and then we looked. We had the uh, numbers plotted here on this piece of paper. Took a pocket calculator and then calculated how many counts that we actually have in this in this peak as subtracted the background. The data didn't come much uh, faster than you could do that with a pocket calculator. We, uh, um, the data storage, by the way, was a little bit old fashioned because we actually stored the data on paper. So we, you saw this guy on the, 
on the right, where he's doing some data analysis, looking for a particular scan. And then we collected this uh, data in boxes, and then we drove home with uh, 10 boxes of paper, which was the data we actually took. And then we have analyzed the data on the way with the pocket calculator and nicely written them down into a logbook. Here you can see we also got a little bit more advanced and made a small script where you can actually automatically calculate uh, the uh, intensity of the peak. We are far from that now. Uh, we have, uh, there's been a tremendous development. We have, uh, when I started, we had uh, detectors that could measure whether it was a photon or not. Today, we have two dimensional detectors where you can also see where on the detector did the photon actually hit. And they are time resolved. You know, we have detectors which uh, measure now with the, with megahertz repetition rate. So here's the data storage when uh, about uh, 10, 10, well, so actually 10, 20 years ago. Uh, we had uh, more data storage about uh, uh, 2011, and I still remember that when I went home from uh, um, experiments that was in Switzerland, and we did experiments, we had bought 10 of these uh, data devices and we uh, carried them home in algae plastic boxes. So you see, this is completely outrageous today. So here's how it works at European Expo. We have um, on the left, you can see uh, how much data we have uh, we have collected. 2019, about uh, 10 petabyte, a little bit less in 2020 due to the pandemic, so we could not really collect data. You can see on the uh, plot on the right, you have the data size in petabyte. Then you can see the date, and then you can see uh, how the amount of data we have stored, the raw data we have stored, is actually increasing. And every you no, know, see here is say where you, the flat uh, horizontal plateau. That's where we stopped this summer due to the COVID nineteen. We had no experiments running, and all the vertical lines. That's where the ATIP detector starts to work, and then we really produce a lot of uh, a lot of raw data. So uh, this is uh, one of the biggest uh, challenges we have is uh, to uh, to manage and manipulate and analyze a huge amount of data. So where are we actually uh, with this here? You can see the detectors. We have the various, we have several types of Egypt detectors. We have a LPD detector. I, I also showed you, I could see sort of the, the, uh, the, the data range uh, that we are collecting the amount of, of raw data. And for comparison, you can see, um, I also listed here, the amount of data that comes out of the CERN detector. So we basically produce data at the moment is at the same amount of uh, of uh, of CERN. Now, uh, and our one of our biggest uh, challenges is is uh, is data reduction that's built in in the detectors at CERN that they only measure the uh, the good events where we collect all the data that we uh, that we uh, that the detectors actually measuring without. Uh, checking whether it's uh, it's uh, good or bad, and we uh, the, there's a special challenge here that physicists are emotionally attached to the data. Now, as soon as they have the data, you can take away their husband and their wife, you can take away the kids uh, or, or, or whatever, but you cannot take away the data. Then they come, then they take you to court for the human rights. So if you have to analyze the data and produce the data before you give it to the users. And that's one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, challenges that we're actually working on now, because at the moment we have a data rate which is, is, is uh, quite large. We also have to, uh, the different requirements, uh, we need to store the data, we need to process the data, we need to transport the data. We have local resources at, uh, at European Exfil, then the uh, uh, data is uh, transported to, to DAISY um, uh, 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 nearby, where they also stored. And then we have recently made a also fast uh, data connection to, uh, to NCBJ near, near, near Warsaw, which can have a, um, a 100 gigabytes per second data, so they could also participate in the data analysis and data management. So this is an, a very interesting part of uh, of the challenge we have a European Excel, the high data rates we are, are working on. Now, before I end here, um, I told you about some of the science we, we, we have been doing. I told you something about the data uh, challenge we are actually having and 
please, if you're interested, look on our website if you want to look for jobs. We're always looking for good uh, uh, scientists and uh, data and uh, engineers. Um, but then I'll just end up saying we have six user experiments, uh, six uh, experiments, they're all in user operation. You can uh, you can see them here. The first started in September 17, the next uh, started in the end of 18, and the last they uh, got online in 19, and now they're all producing data, and they are uh, uh, and data uh, is, uh, is being published. We have many high impact uh, publications, so we had a actually a very good start. So <clears throat> that was about European next one. But before I end, I will also tell a little bit about uh, why is it that we at all do science? You know, what is it what actually comes out? And here um, I will end up by a few slides on the importance of large scale facilities. And then I will put the question here, what is the most important outcome of CERN? What's the most important thing they have done? So first of all, they have discovered the Higgs boson. And second of all, they have created the World Wide Web. So what CERN has been doing, is doing, and what all large-scale facilities are doing, we do science and we do technology. And I think you have to understand both things are extremely important for the outcome of large-scale facilities. I have here uh, taken a little bit, um, looking at disruptive technologies over the last 100 years. And then we can speculate what the, the role of large-scale infrastructures. Now, disrupt technology, I'm taking a personal view here. So this here is my grandfather, Bartolt, born in 1800 and, uh, 18, uh, 1880 or something like that. He participated in the First World War. He was born in the, uh, in the uh, in northern part of Germany. That's I'm now in the southern part of Denmark. The most important for him, the most disruptive technology for him was the car. So the car changed his life. This is my father, Gunther. He, uh, the, he was born in 29, 1929, and the thing that changed his life was the television. Now, this is me, some years uh, younger, and what changed my life with really was a disruptive technology was the laptop. We don't know this. I have been, when I did my, my master thesis, it was still on a, on a normal typewriter where they have a correcting water, et cetera. I had the, all drawing, drawings had to be uh, hand drawn and photocopied in. This is my son, Nikolai. What changed his life is the iPhone, the the. The, the handy. This has been his disruptive technologies. This is my grandson, Asker. Something will change his life. Something will be disruptive. What he's doing that his uh, parents and grandparents did not do. I don't know what it is, but there will be something. Now, if you look and see this, all these here contains basic sciences. Uh, the car, um, there's a lot of metallurgy and uh, thermodynamics. The uh, the television, though, there's a go. There are Nobel prizes into the television. The discovery of the electron, the transistor, and stuff. The integrated circuits in in my computer. The CCD camera in the in the in in the uh, in the handy. I'm pretty sure that whatever will uh, change the life of Asker, there will be some Nobel prizes behind it. And our role in all this here is uh, that we study new materials because all of these technologies I just show you, the basis of them is some new kind of materials, silicon or CCD devices, something that uh, that would create new technologies. Touchscreens, for instance, is something that has completely changed our our life. And we are in for do we do here. Our role is to do advanced characterization techniques. And I show you here, it's not only European x well there are synchrotron radiation sources, there are electron microscopes, uh, there's neutron sources. We all are there to study materials and, uh, and also uh, uh, bio, biomolecules. That is what we are, are, are there for. And to end up with the very last slide, is uh, the COVID-19. I mean, you can hardly do a talk these days without talking about the, the, the pandemic. So I allow myself here to have a slide on the pandemic and large-scale facilities. You here have seen these uh, COVID-19 viruses. You have seen them, I know, a million times already. 
But you might have not thought about where do these images actually come from, because somebody has actually studied uh, these viruses, the different parts of them, the different proteins, and then constructed these these images. They come. They are they are they are basis of science. And uh, when the COVID-19 uh, uh, started, a lot of different groups started to uh, to study the various proteins, the viruses, etc., with electron microscopes and with singleton radiation. And here are some of the very first uh, uh, articles that came out in Science and Nature in March, April. The uh, Chinese immediately went to their synchrotron, studied uh, uh, um, some uh, structure-based design of, uh, of uh, candidates targeting this uh, uh, COVID-19 um, uh, uh, virus. Uh, there was a very nice uh, study done in Germany by the group of Hildenfeld, where they also looked at uh, some crystal structures. All that was done at the Basie II synchrotron in, in Berlin. And of course, the Americans also used their advanced photon source, synchrotron source in Argon to do uh, some of these uh, studies here. And every, at least every region needs to have one of these these. Uh, these facilities to, to do this kind of, of science. So what I say here, we have a vaccine uh, uh, based on science, a vaccine which I'll be proud of taking. I know it's uh, based on a lot of science that has been done. And, uh, and every, as I said, every region needs to have uh, some of these uh, large-scale facilities. Could you imagine that the Mrs. Merkel would have to call to China and say, oh, by the way, we have to study this. Can we borrow your synchrotron? Or could you imagine Merkel would call Trump and say, oh, could I lend you a synchrotron for a couple of days to study this protein? No, it's unthinkable. Unthinkable. Every, every uh, region needs to have these large-scale facilities, synchrotrons, X-ray fields, and lasers, neutron sources, and electron microscopes. That's an essential part of the infrastructure to be able to uh, to attack such uh, crises that we had with the pandemic. And I think with that, I would say, end my talk. It's a little bit too late to say Merry Christmas, but I can at least say a Happy New Year. And now I don't know what's going to happen. Okay, thank you. For your talk, now um, we'll have a short Q&A session. There have been some questions from the audience and Twitter and IRC. I think most um, are asking uh, yeah, probably a bit personal question. What made you choose this venue for your talk? Well, most probably don't expect the chairman of an international research institution at a hacker conference. So. We're glad you're here, but why did you choose it? I chose this. Uh, I said I want to tell what we're actually doing. I want to tell what kind of science we're doing. And then I hope I give you a flavor of the challenges that uh, we have with our detectors, with our electronics, and with our data analysis. Yes. And another question, what practical applications uh, would the financing partners be mostly interested in? I think you have partly answered that one before in the last two slides. But I think the uh, the financing partners, what they are interested in is uh, they want to be part of the most advanced technology you can actually do. And uh, and these are, um, you know, uh, accelerators, free insulators, detectors, because only by participating in this kind of advanced infrastructure, you really, you really uh, get the technology. You need to do it your, your, uh, yourself. And then you also they open up the um, these facilities are then a tool for the user groups, for the university groups, that they can do the most advanced science uh, that is possible these days, and thereby also train in the best way their students. Okay. And then one more. In one of your slides, you had this tiny bubble called X-ray optics. Yeah. How do you do optics with a beam that can evaporate on its steel? Yes, that's, that's a very good question. Um, actually, the beam, uh, it's, it's, um, we have, when the beam is born, then it's about, uh, in the undulator, it's about some few microns, uh, um, Big, but then it's a slight di divergence. So then we let it um, 
then we let it uh, run for about a kilometer. And after a kilometer, the beam is bigger. And then it could be uh, maybe a millimeter. And then you can put in a lens. And you can either have a lens or a mirror, a bent mirror or a lens um, to focus the beam again. And when you focus, and then that there the lens can actually take the beam. The lens is made of a beryllium, which uh, absorbs the X-rays. Or you have a mirror, which is uh, is reflecting all the X-rays, so very little is uh, penetrating the mirror. So there you can actually handle the beam. But as soon as you focus the beam, you cannot uh, you cannot uh, you, you cannot stop it anymore. Yes. Okay. That concludes the questions. Thank you again for the talk.